Well, Father, I just truly do thank you and I praise you for this man of God that you spoke through. I thank you, Father God, for the word that you've spoken through him and even through the churches throughout the, the United States and even overseas. And Father God, I also thank you for the people who came out to sit at your table this morning to receive fresh manna from heaven. And Father God, let your Holy Spirit dwell within us richly this day, right now. Move among us. Let your angelic coast move among us, Father God, and do the things that need to be done in each one of your people. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was doing the uh, monthly newsletter, well, I was asking God what he wanted me to write about. He wanted me to write about forgiveness. So as I was writing about forgiveness, then he said, I want for the month of March, I want you to write, to teach about forgiveness. So we're going to be, teach, be learning about forgiveness. And this morning, um, God titled his father, forgive them. And Luke twenty three thirty four. then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, and they divide his garments and cast lots. Jesus himself, hanging on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. We're not hanging on a cross. We never have hung on a cross, but we still don't know how to say, Father, forgive them. We still want them to be crucified. And we don't want to give them the grace that God has given us. God said there is a forgiveness that surpasses all forgiveness. And I wish this day to give you that kind of forgiveness. This is what God must do to you today. This is a forgiveness that my son Jesus carried all the way to the cross. And even this day is ever interceding for you. Asking me to forgive and show grace. Let's read that again. There is a forgiveness that surpasses all forgiveness, and I wish this day to give you that kind of forgiveness. This is a forgiveness that my son Jesus carried all the way to the cross, even and even this day is ever interceding for you, asking me to forgive and show grace. Every child born into the earth needs forgiveness. There is not one who will not sin before the final resting day. You need forgiveness from me, and you need forgiveness from your fellow brothers and sisters. God went on to say, the pain that is sent forth from the body of Christ is unexplainable. The pain that is sent forth from the body of Christ is unexplainable. The pain goes so deep and so wide, and it does so much damage. You need me to forgive you consistently throughout your life because of the hurt you send to others, either knowingly or unknowingly. Be all wise in everything you do, little ones, and you will continually walk in the peace that passes all understanding. That peace that will not send hurt and pain, but peace that will put the fires of hell out, heal the brokenhearted, and set the captives free. Be all wise in everything you do, little ones, and you will continually walk in the peace that passes all understanding, that peace that will not send hurt and pain, but peace that will put the fires of hell out, heal the brokenhearted, and set the captives free. God says, why is there so much pain in my body? Where does it come from? These are questions that you have to answer yourself before it is too late and you spend eternity in the abyss. There would be no pain in my body if my body would live my word, but the body does not heed what my word teaches, and therefore there is strife and discord everywhere you look. There will always be wars and rumors of war, but it should not come, come from inside my house of prayer and worship. The whiplash of Pharaoh should never be seen in my house. My house is called to be a hospital, and all can come into the hospital to be healed without being judged, bruised, and condemned. The whiplash of Pharaoh should never be seen in my house. My house is called to be a hospital, and all can come into the hospital to be healed without being judged, bruised, and condemned. Do you understand that's why a lot of people won't go through deliverance? Because they don't want somebody knowing what's really in the depth of them. And they don't want people talking about them or ridiculing them. 
And if you don't have deliverance in your church, then you need to get deliverance in your church to set the captives free. But when you set the captives free, you don't sit around and ridicule what was in a person. God said, you claim to be my children, but is there healing in your wings? Is there a place where honesty can come forth without ridicule? Is there a place where the captives will feel free and never be judged for their sins or the sins of the ancestors? Is there a place where honesty can come forth without ridicule? That's where that song would really fit in right now. You know, about telling the truth. We have to be truthful for what's going on inside of us. Because as long as you push that truth down and don't bring it forth, you're a captive. You're a slave to your own self. And the problem with the body of Christ is we keep putting on this little happy face that really isn't true. We're hurting really bad behind that face. But we know that the body of Christ won't understand our pain. And we know that the body of Christ loves to gossip and whisper behind backs. And so therefore we keep that pain deep inside and we're never set free. If you have a church like that, then your church is not of God. Because we need to be able, the people need to be able to tell what's going on inside without being in fear of being ridiculed and talked about and damaged. All right? Now that was what God said. All of us have failed in so many ways, and we have done wrong countless times. Yet as imperfect as we are, when we come to Jesus, we know we will not be despised, but accepted, not spurned, but loved. Can you say that that is you. Can you say that you're that type of person if somebody comes to you that you will not despise them, you, you will accept them, you will not spurn them, but you will love them. So each one of you make up the house of God. And each one of you have to live this life outside the house of God. As a perfect of love, uh, as a vessel of love, a vessel of acceptance, and a vessel of honor that will give, make other people feel like they are honored also. If you aren't that type of a person, then God can't use you. We have to stop and, and reevaluate ourselves and see who am I really? And what am I really doing to the people that God sends my way? My question is, is that how we usually treat those who have offended us or hurt us? Colossians 3.13, the Message Bible tells us, forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. We don't practice that scripture. Alexander Pope said, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Being divine, Jesus displayed his forgiving heart, and he can enable us to have a forgiving heart, just like his. Practice love even when it's not easy. Authentic forgiveness stems from a deep faith that we are enough that love is abundant, and that even though we have been wronged, we don't have to spend our emotional energy trying to have that debt paid back to us. The body of Christ does not live this. And therefore, we are just like the world, and Jesus says that we should come out of the world, we should be peculiar people, and we should not be like the world, that we, they should be able to distinguish us from them. So I said, practice love even when it's not easy. And we all know that sometimes loving somebody is not easy. Authentic forgiveness stems from a deep faith that we are enough. You know, that we know that in Christ we can do all things. That love is abundant. God loves us abundantly. And that even though we have been wronged, 
we don't have to spend our emotional energy trying to have that debt paid back to us. I hear so many Christians say, I want to be vindicated. They don't use those words, but that's what they want. They want everybody to know that they're correct and somebody else did them wrong. It's not God. All right, this kind of trust doesn't come easily. It takes practice to train our minds to learn to let go of what's not important so we can make room for things that really matter. We need to start practicing forgiveness. We need to focus on ways to learn to accept, forgive, and love each other. You know, so many people, let's talk about marriages. The marriage goes wrong. And they become bitter. And, you know, or, or, so we have a godly person whose spouse that goes wrong. And they get a divorce while well, the godly person becomes bitter. And then along the line somewhere, the spouse gets saved, goes to heaven, and, and then the bitter person goes to hell. And then a shame. Why would, you, why would you become bitter because somebody wanted to leave you? You ought to thank God that they did. Because they don't care for you. They're not doing you any good. We need to understand that forgiveness is a journey and not a destination. In other words, it is rarely a one-time fixed event or a single ungrudging gesture in response to an isolated offense. It is part of a persistent human engagement in healing broken relationships. It is a persistent human engagement in healing broken relationships. The reason why we can't forgive people is because we don't look at them through the eyes of Christ. We don't look, let, see God, say, God, let me see them as you see them, and we never look past the surface to look deep into their heart to find out why they're doing what they are doing. And if you would really be godly, and if you would really ask God, why are they doing what they're doing? Let me see through your eyes. You would be totally shocked at what God shows you that for the reason why they're doing what they're doing. An example, I have somebody in my life who continually does wrong to me. And a week ago, somebody came to me and said, they do that because they know there's no consequences. I said, well, that's not true. And I says, I'm not going to give them consequences because God has shown me the deep hurt and the pain, the split personalities, and this person just doesn't really exist anymore. But, you know, the original person, because the personality has been split so many times that you just don't know which personality is going to come up. See, why do we always have to have a consequence for somebody? Why can't we why can't we just love them as Christ loves them? And why can't we forgive them as Christ forgave you and he's forgiven them? And why can't we be a true body of Christ where we just walk in love? All right. Where am I at here? God's will for us. God's will for us is very clear. Bear with each other and forgive each other. To, be, to bear with someone means to be patient with them, to be long-suffering with them, basically, to attempt to put up with them, to endure them. That's what long-suffering is all about. To be patient with them, to be long-suffering with them, basically, to attempt to put up with them and to adore, endure them. Sometimes you have to go through these steps to save a soul. Because if you keep praying the love of Christ over them and keep interceding for them, eventually God's going to move in their life. To forgive each other is pretty straightforward. And when we qual qualify it with, as the Lord forgave you, then we really have a challenge. To forgive each other is pretty straightforward. And when we qualify it with, as the Lord forgave you, then we really have a challenge. When we think about Jesus' forgiving heart, 
Think about how difficult it must have been for him to bear with and forgive his disciples. Jesus had so many reasons to be disappointed in, in and unforgiving toward the twelve. For most part, they did not fully understand him. People are not ever going to fully understand you. I don't care how long you live. They're just not. The twelve had their doubts, denials, and even betrayal to Jesus. I wonder if Jesus had at some time during his ministry regretted regretted calling the twelve. And I believe he did. <laughs> Come on, you know, he, he was God, but he was also human. I'm quite sure when in the garden when he's what, can't you even pray with me for an hour? I don't think he said it smiling and, you know, and love dripping off his lips. He was upset with them, disappointed in them. Jesus said in Luke 24, 25, they were slow of heart to believe. That was about his 12. They were slow of heart to believe. They argued about who was the greatest among them. They slept when they should have been praying and standing by Jesus. And think about this. Jesus not only knew their past failures, private doubts, and unspoken thoughts, he saw their future failures. He knew about Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal before they happened. But yet he still loved them. He still forgave them. Do you think it was hard for Jesus to love Peter, knowing Peter would someday deny him? Was it tough to love Thomas, knowing Thomas would even question his resurrection? Did Jesus love them less, knowing that they would all flee when he needed them most in the Garden of Gethsemane? Why did Jesus stick with the original 12 and not recruit a new batch? <laughs> yeah. The other day I was upset with my crew and I said, God, just wipe them all out and give me a whole new batch. And yeah. <laughs> so why did Jesus stick with the original 12 and not recruit a new batch? Because Jesus had a forgiving heart. See, I really had to repent and get my heart right. right and I'm being honest, you know. When Jesus was in a relationship with people, he accepted them as they were with all their imperfections and failures. When Jesus was in a relationship with people, that he accepted them as they were with all their imperfections and failures. We don't do that. Don't even tell me you do. You'd be lying. You have to get up here and repent. You want everybody to be just like Jesus. You want them to be you want them to be absolutely positively perfect and if, if they do one thing wrong you're ready to cast them aside Jesus was not going to leave them as they were but he accepted them as they were so we when we have somebody that's imperfect in our lives besides us then we have to hold them up before the father knowing that the father can change them if somebody prays for them. Of all the times we see Jesus as a forgiving heart, none is so precious as when he kneels before his disciples and washes their feet. John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. See, Jesus always knew who he was. The body of Christ forgets who they are, and that's why you get in a twit because you don't know who you are, so you have to pick on somebody else because you feel inferior. If you could always remember who you are in Christ Jesus, you wouldn't have that problem. All right, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then Jesus came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. He's talking about Judas. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, Jesus said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, as a, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. When I was married to my second husband, and a couple months into my marriage, God said, wash his feet. He said, right here in the church, right here in the church, I washed his feet. I didn't understand what God was asking me to do. See, God knew what he was going to put me through before he got saved. So I washed, I had, God had me wash his feet to become his servant and to endure the things that I was going to have to endure until he got saved. Now, in Jesus' day, the washing of feet was a task reserved not just for servants, but for the lowest of servants. In Jesus' day, the washing of feet was a task reserved not just for servants, but for the lowest of servants. And Jesus was not the lowest of the servants. Every circle had its pecking order, including the circle of household servants. The servant at the bottom of the pecking order was expected to be the one on his knees with the towel and basin. But in this case, the one with the towel and basin was the king of the universe. The one before whom all nations will one day kneel, now now before his disciples. Just hours before his own death, Jesus had only one thing on his mind. He wanted them to know how much he loved them. Much more than removing dirt, Jesus was trying to remove all doubt. You know, as I was reading that, I thought about the time, remember, when the lady came in and washed Jesus' feet with the oil and wiped it with her hair, and he said, I came in, and you, never, you didn't even wash my feet. Think about this. Jesus knew the future of the feet he was washing. These 24 feet would dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. Only one pair of feet that he washed would stand with Jesus at Calvary, and that was John. John stood, stayed at Calvary. Jesus silently lifted the feet of his betrayer and washed them in the basin. You know, that was Judas. Because it doesn't tell us that he did not wash Judas' feet. He said he washed the twelve. Jesus gave his disciples an amazing gift that night. He knew what these men were about to do. He knew that they were about to perform the most cowardly, vile acts of their lives. By morning, they would bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet with disgust. And when they did, did Jesus wanted them to remember how he knelt before them and washed their feet. He wanted them to realize that their feet were still clean. John thirteen seven says, As he washed their feet, he said to them, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. And they did later on. How remarkable Jesus forgave their sin before they even committed it. He offered mercy before they even sought it. This is what we should be doing to people. We should be offering them forgiveness before, they, before they, we even know what they're all about. We should be full of mercy for anybody that comes, not just in the house of God, but comes in our homes or that we meet anywhere. We should be full of forgiveness and mercy toward them before we know anything at all about them. If you're like me, then you are really, you are likely thinking, I can never do that. The hurt is so deep. The wounds are so numerous. Even when I think of them, I cringe. That is precisely why we must shift our gaze. 
we must turn our gaze away from the ones who have hurt us to the one who has saved us. The secret of being just like Jesus is fixing your eyes on him. I said that because whenever, you know, God had me wash my husband's feet, and later on, you know, I had to go through all things I went through. And I said, God, why didn't you warn me what I was going to go through? He said, because if you would have known, you wouldn't have done it. You know? And that's why you know, I had to constantly look turned. He would say, just keep looking in my eyes, and I'll walk through this with you. See, it's not about what was happening to me. It was all about the soul that Jesus had placed in my hands to love, forgive, and bring forth. And see, we, we don't live like that. Look what they've done to me. Look what they've done to me. Look what they've done to me. Love them no matter what they put you through. Jesus loves you no matter what you put him through. And believe me, some of you have put him through a lot. Yet he still loves you. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. What Jesus says for his disciples, I'm sorry, what Jesus did for his disciples, he has already done for you. He has cleansed us, not our feet from dirt, but our souls from sin. Even more, Jesus is still cleansing us. If we are walking in the light, then we are always being cleansed. Jesus kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives. But rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out and says, I can clean that if you want. Jesus kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives. But rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out and says, I can clean that if you want. He never turns his back on you like you turn your back on him. He never looks down in disgust at a person on the street or a person in prison. He doesn't do that. He could look down in the church and see, see more things to be disgusted about than he does on the streets. Because I watch the church people and they don't honor the Father. They do terrible things in the house of God and call themselves Christians. All right, I said, and from the basin of his grace, remember he took the basin and cleaned her feet, and from the basin of his grace, he scoops a palm full of mercy and washes away our sin. And that is not all he does, because he lives in us. You and I, you and I can do the same toward others. Because he has forgiven us, we can forgive others. Because he has a forgiving heart, we can have a forgiving heart. We can have a heart like his. And Jesus said in John 13, 14 and 15, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. That is what it means to have a heart like Jesus, to kneel, at Jesus, to kneel as Jesus knelt, touching the grimy parts of the people who have wronged us, washing away the wrong. That is what it means to have a heart like Jesus, to kneel at Jesus as Jesus knelt, touching the grimy parts of the people who have wronged us, washing away the wrong. I have to tell this too when I wash my husband's feet. Well, I'm going to wash your feet too. And he didn't know what he was doing either, but there were times in our marriage where I wasn't very loving or forgiving. You know, there's times that I would just, I mean, I didn't do it to him, but it, I did it in my heart. I thought about it in my little stupid head. And I didn't have nice thoughts and I had to work through it. See, he washed my, I washed his feet and he washed my feet. So we were both washing away the sins of each other. Now I'm asking you this morning, 
How do you wash somebody's feet that has wronged you? you know, it doesn't matter how they wronged you. It really doesn't. The body of Christ is always going to hurt the body of Christ. I haven't seen that for 40-some years, and it makes me sick to watch it. But there's not a thing you can do about it. The only thing you can do about it is keep your own heart right. Just keep your own heart right. Don't worry about what somebody else's heart is like. If you're a child of God then, and, you, and you know the word, then you need to do what Jesus did and be just like Jesus. And uh, show the world that's in the church that there is a God who forgives and forgets. He doesn't hold anything to your charge. Do you know that? Doesn't the word tells us he throws into the sea of forgetfulness? I don't think we believe that, though. A lot of people don't even know the Bible. Do you have the forgiving heart that, that, that Jesus has? And what did Jesus say in the beginning? There is a forgiveness that surpasses all forgiveness, and I wish this day to give you that kind of forgiveness. This is the forgiveness that my son Jesus carried all the way to the cross. And, and even this day is ever interceding for you, asking me to forgive and show grace. So this morning what God wants to give you is, is a forgiving heart. You know, there is a forgiveness that passes all forgiveness. And that's what he wants to give you, the forgiveness that surpasses all forgiveness. And that you won't hold any ought within your heart against anybody from this point forward. And it doesn't matter what, they're, what they do to you, you're going to forgive. 